Looking There's at somebody's less. nose. Are we muted now? No. Good. Hi, Les. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Hello. I'm putting you on mute because I've got a lot of noise in the background here. I'm not putting you on mute. I'm putting me on mute. <laughs> <laughs> That's a moot point. <laughs> Hi, Butch. Hi there. Who's that? Butch Childers. Oh. Hello, Frank, I thought I saw Frank Garvey. Yeah, Albert. There's Al. Al. Hey, Al. Yeah. And uh, Mike. Hi, Mike. Hello. 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 Dustin, hey. How you doing, Pam? Hi. Carl. And Sh Charlotte, did we have anyone to introduce Otis for today? Actually, I'm introducing it. Is Charlotte having the technical difficulties? It's Mari. I'm supposed to introduce Otis, so y'all yeah. have to get started. Okay, here we go. Yeah. Yeah, Mari. <laughs> okay. take, it, take it from here, Mari. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Otis. Um, I think Otis has been making the rotary rounds today. I think you spoke at the Island Branch Rotary Club at noon. Is that right? That is correct. That is correct. <laughs> We are thrilled to have you here uh, to kick off our, the theme of our month is journalism. So what a perfect speaker to kick off that, uh, that theme because Otis uh, fell in love with newspapers. I think ever since you were six years old, he used to read the commercial appeal to his dad. And then at age 10, he decided he wanted to be a newspaper reporter. And uh, I think that you, you, at age 12, you, were, you tried out for the basketball team or didn't make it. So you decided to write an article that got published when he was in seventh grade in the, uh, the high school newspaper, of which you eventually became the editor of. Is that correct? That's and correct. So that, you know, kicked off your, your journalism career. Um, you have also written, I know, two books. The, in the colorful place, I have an autographed copy, and then our book club actually read, you know, from uh, Boss Crump to King Willie. So that was excellent. Highly recommend. Um, so you're here today to, you know, just talk about how you got started in your journalism career, or just about your journalism career, taking us through the books, some of your favorite columns, and uh, one of the things I might suggest you kick it off is uh, Mr. Darby was his college counselor. And uh, to quote Otis, he nearly torpedoed my journalism career before it really even got started. So Otis, I'll kind of let you fill us in on what that was all about. And thank you for being here today. Well, well thank you so much, Maury. And uh, good evening to everybody. I see so many uh, familiar friends here and uh, familiar faces. Uh, it's good to be with you. And uh, yeah, uh, Maury is right. I, uh, this is my second um, go around today with Rotary, but uh, I'm happy to do it. Uh, as uh, some of you probably know, I'm, uh, I'm the president elect of the uh, Memphis Rotary, and I'll be taking that over in July. It's a daunting job, but um, uh, I'm sort of looking forward to that uh, as much as any, anybody can look forward to doing a lot of hard work. So um, uh, I guess I'm ready for that. Um, I do want to spend some time um, uh, talking about the book, and I will get to that Price Darby uh, uh, anecdote uh, 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 when I get around to that. But let me, let me just say a, a couple of uh, familiar, uh, a couple of preliminary things first. Because as you said, uh, you're kicking off a discussion about journalism. Uh, and uh, more is right. I've, I've been in journalism ever since I was a, a, a young kid. Got, got started reading the newspaper uh, when my father, um, who was too busy on a farm we had down in, in Mississippi, and he was also a carpenter, and he told me to read the commercial appeal that we got delivered every day by mail and tell him what was in it. And uh, I did that. Uh, I told him more than he ever wanted to know. I bend his ear. <laughs> I told him everything. And because uh, I took the job seriously, I call it my first newspaper job, uh, which was to read the newspaper and tell my dad what was in it, especially the sports. Um, but honestly, that, that, that um, made me fall in love with newspapers. And, uh, and while I told the uh, Olive Branch Rotary today that, that journalism uh, has uh, 
undergone, especially newspaper journalism, has undergone massive changes over the last 15 to 20 years. Um, it's not the same uh, as it was when I first started. Uh, I started in the golden era of journalism in the 1970s. Um, I was in college when Watergate happened. Uh, and uh, I had the opportunity at Ole Miss uh, to cover uh, a visit to the campus by Senator Howard Baker. Uh, and I wrote the story. It got published on the front page of the Daily Mississippian uh, campus paper. And really that, uh, that even further fortified my interest in, in newspaper journalism and politics. Uh, and over the years, uh, I've worked at uh, four um, pretty good newspapers, starting in Jackson, Mississippi at the Clarion Ledger, and then here in Memphis, my first go around, and then in Pittsburgh for the Pittsburgh Press. I moved over to Detroit, the Detroit Free Press, and then came back to Memphis in 1994 in senior leadership at the Commercial Appeal. And as I told the group today, uh, uh, the, the, the difference between when I came back uh, to the commercial appeal in 94 and what the commercial appeal today is, is light years. I came back to a newspaper that had a newsroom staff only in the newsroom of almost 220 people. And we covered everything. Uh, and now, and we had a daily circulation of well over 100,000 and a Sunday circulation of about 200,000. Today, uh, they, they have a newsroom staff of 35 people and uh, daily circulation is around 20 some thousand and the Sunday circulation is about 44,000 for a metro area that's almost a million. Now uh, that's, that's print, um, that, that's you know, the print product. And of course, they, you know, like everybody else, they're online like everybody else. Uh, so those numbers may not reflect their online presence, or it may be in addition to their online presence. But the point is that new, the news, the printed newspaper is not what it used to be. But the journalism is still there to be done. And in my role at the university uh, teaching out there, uh, we teach our students not about newspapers, we teach them about how to deliver content uh, in a lot of different ways. We teach them about creative mass media uh, and being, um, being able to use all platforms to deliver a message and to tell a story, um, to communicate, um, to write well. Um, those are the things that we teach at the University of Memphis uh, and our enrollment um, especially pre-COVID, our, our enrollment was going up every semester. I mean, we had, we were very robust. Matter of fact, we were even uh, in the process now of starting a, um, a, a doctorate program uh, in journalism at the University of Memphis, which we have never had. Uh, so, um, so things are looking up there. I just, I hope uh, once we get past uh, the pandemic, um, that uh, some of the loss that we had over the last year uh, will start to come back. Um, but I've been around this city most of my adult life doing journalism. Uh, I covered some of you uh, uh, when I was a, a courthouse reporter. I know I pestered uh, Al Harvey quite a bit <laughs> uh, when he was over there <laughs> uh, uh, handling some cases. And of course, uh, uh, Judge Childers, uh, same, same as, uh, as well. And of course, I've known the uh, Carl and Pan Awesome for many, many years. Uh, so I've been around here doing journalism for quite a while. Um, I hope to continue to do it um, as long as possible in a lot of different roles. Uh, I do want to talk about um, the book, um, the second book. Um, uh, as Maura mentioned, uh, my first book, uh, which uh, uh, was uh, very successful, uh, probably beyond my wildest dreams, uh, from Boss Crump to King Willie, how race changed Memphis politics. Uh, I thank you all for uh, inviting me to book clubs and, and talking about it. Uh, I did that quite a bit in 2017, 18, and even into 19, and the book is still selling. 
Uh, and uh, I'm really uh, appreciative of that. Uh, my second one uh, is a collaboration with Dan Conaway. Uh, Dan and I are both um, columnists for the Daily Memphian now. Um, I met him several years ago, uh, and when we hooked up at the uh, Daily Memphian, um, we, we found that we had uh, a lot in common, even though we were from different worlds. Dan is a city guy from here in Memphis, white guy from Memphis, and I'm a black guy from the farm in Mississippi. And so we grew up in different worlds. Uh, and how we got together is, is just, again, an interesting story of how our paths just sort of meshed later on. And uh, he writes about uh, uh, the people uh, and, and the places in Memphis uh, that he has been familiar with uh, since uh, he was a kid here. Um, he writes, uh, he calls it stream of consciousness uh, about people and about uh, issues. Um, I'm more of a hard hitting um, issue oriented writer. Um, I tend to irritate people from time to time, uh, take, taking on some of the issues uh, in our society from criminal justice to voting rights to um, uh, all of the political shenanigans that happen from time to time. Um, but I think together we offer a, a pretty interesting look at our take. This is our take uh, on life uh, in Memphis. So that's why we called it in a colorful place because Memphis is a very colorful place. Uh, and uh, the title is uh, in a colorful place. Subtitle is seasoned opinion about Memphis, about home and about life. Um, my, my part of the uh, book is uh, broken up into four uh, general uh, areas, uh, politics, race, crime and justice, uh, and the community. Um, and they include um, uh, a lot of the columns that I've written for the Daily Memphian uh, since I started there in 2018. The one thing that I was really not happy about and, 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 and really quite, um, well, I, I guess I could say I was upset about is that the commercial appeal uh, refused to allow me to use any columns I had written for that publication in this book. And I, 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 I appealed to that, um, uh, but they said no. Uh, they said they had a policy of not allowing that uh, unless the, the writer was still connected with Gannett. I don't know that that's true because I believe that they have made exceptions in the past, but I was not in any position to fight it. Uh, and, and I mentioned that in the uh, introduction to this book. Um, but I do wanna talk about the uh, anecdote that Maury mentioned there at the beginning uh, about a guy by the name of uh, uh, Price Darby, Richard Price Darby. Mr. Darby um, was the guidance counselor uh, at Northwest, back then it was called Northwest Mississippi Commu uh, Junior College in Senatobia. Uh, he had been the principal at North Panola High School in Sardis um, before uh, integrate, full integration happened there. And full integration didn't happen in, in Mississippi until 1970. That was 16 years after the Brown versus Board of Education decision. Um, and I went uh, my senior year, uh, I graduated from North Panola High, uh, and that was the first year I'd ever set foot in a classroom uh, uh, with other white students. Uh, when I decided to go to Northwest uh, right out of high school, because it was close to home and I could drive my mother's car there, um, I knew I wanted to major in journalism. But um, I was still told that I needed to go to see the guidance counselor there. So I had to go see Mr. Darby. And Mr. Darby uh, was very polite. Uh, he was very kind, very accommodating to me. Um, but he basically told me in no uncertain terms that 
I was going to have some trouble. Uh, he said, uh, pretty much implied that because I went to an inferior high school uh, for 11 of my years in school, um, that someone like me would probably not make it as a journalist. Said my goals were a little too lofty uh, for that. Um, I, uh, let me just read exactly what I said here in the book. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm not in the habit of, of reading long passages from, from my books, but I do want to read this part. Because I sat down in front of him uh, and he had my transcript there and he scanned over, and this is directly from the book, he scanned over my high school records, occasionally nodding at my good grades. I had just graduated from North Panola High School where he served as principal before integration came. His daughter, Rita Nell, was in my graduating class and surely that would earn me a little credibility with him. But I had spent all but my senior year at all black North Panola vocational high school in Como. That school, Darby concluded, was too inferior academically to produce someone angling to be a newspaper reporter. I think you're going to have trouble, he told me. I think you'd be better off with some sort of vocational training. In other words, I needed to focus on a career working with my hands, just not with a pen, notepad, and a typewriter. Well, my mother did once say she thought I should get into industrial arts, I said respectfully. That's it, he quickly responded. And he seemed to be relieved that he had talked me out of such a lofty career pursuit without insulting me or hurting my feelings. I thanked him and quietly left his office. Later that day, I turned in my official enrollment papers where it said major, I wrote in large block letters, journalism. I was not about to let Mr. Darby, as nice as he was, he was a nice man. I was not gonna let him destroy my dream. I have to say that years later, many years later, I had, I had gone to these other newspapers and come back to Memphis, um, I spoke at Northwest and Mr. Darby was still there. He was almost headed toward retirement. He's since passed on now, but this was in the late nineties. Uh, and I had a reunion with Mr. Darby and he was very nice. He had followed my career. Um, he never mentioned the fact that he tried to talk me out of journalism and neither did I. Uh, it was just one of those things in history uh, that um, I let pass, uh, but I, when I was writing the forward to this book, the intro to the book, I felt that it was important to say that, not to disparage him or his family who's still around, uh, his, his daughter is still around, but to just make the point that um, it's important to listen to people especially when you're in positions like that uh, as, a, as, a, as a guidance counselor or as a faculty advisor, even now uh, I do some of that at the university. It's important to do more listening sometimes than to do the talking. And Mr. Darby didn't do a lot of listening. He did most of the talking. Uh, and that was a lesson that I learned from that. Um, but the columns that I did, that I did uh, um, settle on uh, in this book uh, cover a, a wide range of my writings over the last few years. Um, some of the ones that I'm probably uh, most fond of, um, I wrote a column last year um, when um, we were going through the racial turmoil in this country. Uh, and I reflected back on the bloody Sunday in Selma, Alabama uh, when John Lewis uh, was beaten uh, and others uh, in that march were beaten. And I asked the question in the column, where is our Lyndon Johnson moment? Who would be the person who would stand up 
uh, and, and lead us out of what was a terrible situation. Lyndon Johnson, as you might recall, just three days after Bloody Sunday, when he took Congress and proposed the Voting Rights Act. Uh, and he said it was necessary, we, we have to do it. And he used the words to that song, we shall overcome. Well, I didn't find that Lyndon Johnson moment last year when we were going through a racial reckoning in this country after the killing of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and, and the other things that had happened. Um, and I wrote a column about that. Uh, and I think that one got probably more response, uh, e even outside of Memphis, um, than any column that I think I've written um, for the, uh, uh, for the uh, Daily Memphian. A couple of others that I've mentioned that are in there, um, uh, when, I, when I talk about crime and justice, I wrote a column and it was a tough one to write, um, but I felt it needed to be said. And I wrote a column about the last moments of Phil Trenary's life. And that was just a heartbreaking, heartbreaking story. Um, but I, I got an opportunity to, to do some research on that with help from um, uh, uh, several people. Uh, and even got to see the video because there was a surveillance video of Phil just walking down the street on his cell phone. Uh, and so I did that, talked to several people. Uh, uh, Henry Turley was a, a great help to me on that one. And I sort of tried to recreate what was the final moments of Phil Trenera's life and talk about how senseless his death was. Um, another one on the crime and, 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 and uh, justice, uh, you might recall a couple of years ago, a young man out in Frazier by the name of Brandon Weber uh, was shot to death by a uh, U.S. Marshals Task Force who um, were looking for him after he had um, uh, carjacked a man in, in Hernando and shot him and left him for dead in the streets and took his car. Uh, and the, and the uh, task force, which was made up of police and, and deputy marshals, they finally tracked him down and they used social media to do it. And they caught him in, his, in the neighborhood where he lived out in Frazier. He had, he had said on social media that he would not be taken alive. He had a gun, he showed a gun on the, uh, uh, on the Facebook post. And so when, he, when the cops showed up, he tried to flee, ran, ran some cars, and he was shot to death. And if you recall, um, that produced a, a night of, of violence in Frazier. Police, police, Memphis police, who were really not involved in it, this was a uh, task force of federal officers for the most part, um, but the police, Memphis police were assaulted and bricks were thrown at uh, police cars and the windows were thrown out and all of that kind of stuff. And, and we even unfortunately had a couple of politicians in town who took political, political advantage of it and posted on Facebook that Mr. Weber had been murdered by law enforcement. Well, the column I wrote basically asked the question, who, there was another voice that was missing in all of the uh, discussion about that case. And that voice was the man who was attacked in DeSoto County. Nobody thought about him, but uh, his, his story needed to be told. And so the column told his story. Uh, didn't get to talk to him because he was still in the hospital, um, but I did get uh, enough information about what actually happened. Did I mute myself there? I don't know what happened. <laughs> I don't know what happened there. Did you all hear what I was saying earlier? <laughs> okay. Well, John Champion, who was the district attorney down in uh, Mississippi, was a great help for that column. And, and, and I think it uh, made some people who read it uh, think twice about what actually happened that night. And 
let's uh, let's not be too let's not rush to make um, uh, statements and and do things until we get all the facts. And the facts are that Mr. Weber, um, Mr. Weber, uh, tried to kill somebody, and he left that person for dead and took his car. Uh, and so let's not forget about the real victim uh, in the case. Uh, but there have been other, there, were, there are a lot of other much more lighthearted uh, and more positive columns uh, in the book. I talk about Lamorne Owens uh, importance to this community and the fact that it got a multi-million dollar a grant from the Community Foundation and how that um, will um, go a long way to, to help that uh, school uh, and, and the work that it does in this community. Uh, when Russell Sugarman passed away, I reflected on his life and his contributions to this community and, the, and what he had done throughout his, his life and his career in Memphis. Same thing when uh, Fred Davis passed away. Um, I got a chance to talk to both of those gentlemen for my first book. They are mentioned prominently in the Boss Crump to King Willie book. Uh, and I feel blessed to have had an opportunity to talk to them at length um, before they, uh, they passed away. And so those are just some of the uh, uh, stories that are in the book. Uh, I do take Lamar Alexander to task because uh, I thought he showed a lack of courage uh, when he refused to vote to have witnesses in the first impeachment trial. And so I wrote a column about that. Um, and so uh, again, I'm, I have a knack for um, sometimes irritating some people. Uh, I also had a column about the Nathan Bedford Forrest uh, bust that I learned today, the historical commission voted today uh, to remove the bust from the state capitol, thank goodness. And they're gonna move it to the museum where it needs to be. Uh, and I think that is a positive thing for this, uh, for the state uh, and um, it shows again that, uh, you know, um, the right thing eventually happens. Uh, and I, I was very vocal over the last two or three years talking about the need to remove that from the state capital, uh, where a place where we talk about equal justice for all um, that is not a place to have Nathan Bitt before us to be honored uh, and um, memorialized there. So those are the uh, uh, columns that I did want to talk about. Um, uh, uh, Dan has a, a lot of great columns in there as well. Uh, the unfortunate thing is we haven't been able to do a, 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 a traveling <laughs> book tour <laughs> book tour because of the pandemic, but we've done several things uh, on, um, on Zoom, uh, on virtual. Matter of fact, we got one scheduled for tomorrow. Uh, and again, the, 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 the interesting thing here is you've got Dan Conaway and you've got Otis Sanford. Um, and we, while we came from different backgrounds, we love this city and we only want what's best for this city. And we write about this city um, the warts and all, uh, only to try to make life better here. Uh, and I think most of our readers understand that and they appreciate that. And so we decided to take some of the best of what we've done and put it in this book. Um, so I'll stop there uh, and uh, I'll be more than happy to take any questions that anyone has about anything that I've said or maybe something that I've done Maybe I've done to you in the past and you want to uh, exact some retribution for it right now. Now is your opportunity to do so. But I'm willing to take any questions that anyone has um, right now. And I see a question here in the chat. Uh, did I see a chat question? Mm -hmm. You can do that, but we'll raise your hand. I have a question. Okay. Um, Otis. You mentioned early on that um, your enrollment in the journalism program out at the University of Memphis was, mm -hmm. was continually growing. Mm -hmm. uh, could you talk a little bit about the, I didn't know that the opportunities in journalism were that robust uh, so that people still feel like they can make a career out of what 
um, journalism, probably that's it's a little bit different definition now than it used to be. Would you expound on that a little bit? Absolutely, Carl, I'd be happy to. Uh, you know, uh, we changed the name of our department about three or four years ago. And we are now called the Department of Journalism and Strategic Media. And there was a reason for that. Um, we don't emphasize the tradition, the old ways of doing journalism. We don't talk about newspapers much at all, even though we still have a, a, a newspaper on the campus, the Daily Helmsman, and we still support it, even though it's, it struggles uh, financially. But we have pretty much revamped our entire curriculum to focus on multimedia uh, uh, and the delivery of content uh, using all kinds of platforms. And the fact that we have public relations and advertising within our department um, means that uh, we're sending people uh, out for job opportunities um, that have nothing to do with traditional journalism, certainly has nothing to do with newspapers or even television. But having said that, though, we still supply uh, a large number of people who, who are still getting those newspaper and television jobs. You know, half of the people who, almost half of the people who work at the Daily Memphian, a U of M grads. Um, the Commercial Appeal still hires um, some of our graduates, but they go on to do other things. It, it, it may be at St. Jude and ALSAC. Uh, it may be at, um, um, at nonprofits and uh, other entities around town. The idea here is to communicate and communicate effectively. So uh, for my part, I focus on the writing. I, I teach people how to write better. Uh, and, and, and communicate in all different platforms. So as we think about journalism today, we don't think about a newspaper. We think about the many ways that people get news and content today, even on social media. And so we incorporate how to be effective on social media um, in delivering uh, uh, news and information. Radio is 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 holding not only is it holding its own uh radio is growing in terms of people who want to get news and information and content from radio uh and we and we teach that we have a partnership right now with the uh, crosstown concourse where we revamped uh the campus radio station changed the call letters and it's now located at Crosstown Concourse, and we're teaching students how to do effective radio communication, including news and everything else that you would do on radio. And now I have a radio show on there with Dr. Rudd every other week, where we talk about a lot of issues, both on campus and off campus. And, you know, with my character, you know, I'll bring up uh, uh, something that a politician has done that's, that's ridiculous. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and Dr. Rudd gets right in there with me. So those are the things, Carl, that, that, that we are teaching out there. And that's why people are interested in what we're doing. And again, before the, uh, before the pandemic, yeah, we were growing every semester. And our graduate program continues to grow even, even during the pandemic. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it, for the, for the average person who, who looks at uh, a journalism department or a journalism school and think about journalism of yesterday, that's not what we're doing out there. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're doing 21st century multimedia teaching and we're trying to get our students to get good jobs, whether it's in PR, advertising, traditional news or, or creative mass media, uh, uh, internet, uh, building websites and things of that nature. That's what we do. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Carl. Other questions? Hey, let me look at uh, Denise's here. Uh, have you ever felt physically at risk after a reaction from a reader? Um, some people do not digest the truth appropriately. Uh, you're right. Um, fortunately, I have never been physically threatened. Um, but obviously I have been 
criticized and called a lot of different names. Um, there's one person in, in, in Memphis right now who's pretty much a troll. Uh, so he follows me to every platform that I'm on. Uh, and he, he attacks me every chance he gets. He even tried to get me fired at the university. Um, but I, that's, that, go, that goes with the territory. I mean, if you're gonna be an opinion journalist, you have to be able to take the criticism. I said that when I first started writing my column at the Commercial Appeal. Uh, I think I wrote that my head was on the chopping block and I'm happy to be there uh, because I, if I'm going to criticize, I have to take the criticism. But I have never been uh, physically threatened. Um, that's not true for a lot of people though, uh, certainly in this climate, um, but I have not. Uh, Dustin, you asked what other ways uh, uh, that I plan to promote equity in, uh, in my upcoming world. That's a really good question uh, because I've been giving that uh, a lot of thought. I will take over uh, as uh, president uh, in July and I've been giving that a lot of thought. Um, I think one thing that I intend to do and we've been having some leadership meetings uh, regularly over the last several months um, and the thing that we have settled on going forward, we're going to focus on four things. We want our club to be known as a place that informs, that inspires, uh, that serves, and that leads. And one of the things that uh, when we were discussing that, that I brought up, and I, and I, I, I I concluded this from my research from my first book, believe it or not, that the Rotary Club was always the place <clears throat> where important discussions on public issues, uh, that was the place where those discussions were, 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 were had. Uh, and I talked specifically about um, right after Dr. King's assassination, um, the following week, John T. Fisher spoke at the Rotary Club and he gave one of the most powerful speeches that I, and I had a chance to, 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 to recall, uh, go back and get the news coverage of it. It was one of the most powerful speeches that's ever been given. Uh, and he talked about the need for us to change in Memphis uh, and, and embrace our diversity uh, and 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 what and focus on what unites us rather than divides us. That was at the Rotary Club, and I think that was the beginning of some change in this community. The same thing happened in 1991 when we had probably the, the most contentious uh, mayoral election uh, in our history, um, except for the one when Boss Crump pulled a gun on somebody. <laughs> but, <laughs> but in 1991. Uh, it was Dick Hackett and um, Dr. Harrington. The only debate they had that year was at the Rotary Club. So the Rotary Club has always been this place where uh, the community could gather. Well, the way I intend to, to foster some equity, I want the Rotary Club to be known as the place where we can have even uncomfortable conversations and that the broader community can be welcomed in um, I'm, I'm hoping for the time very soon when we can get back to having in-person um, uh, meetings. We may not be able to do it every week and we probably shouldn't, but when we do, uh, equity in this community uh, and, and things that promote fairness and, 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 inc and inclusivity uh, will be a focal point of what the Rotary Club will be all about. That's, those are just some of the things that I'm thinking about uh, as I uh, start to take over there. Awesome, thank you. That's great. Uh, the call letters for the uh, radio station is uh, WYXR, it's FM 91.7. Uh, and again, the show that I do, and I'm gonna promote it, I'm gonna plug it right here. It's called Memphis Forward. And it's, uh, it's on every other Tuesday. It was on today, um, but actually you may be able to listen to it from the website because I think they, we stream it on the website as well and it may still be there. Uh, but to listen to it live, 
it's on every other Tuesday. So if it, it, it was today, so the next time it'll be on the 23rd of, um, of March at 11 a.m. Uh, on 91.7 FM, WYXR. Uh, any ideas on how we may break through our polarized tribal media bubbles? Oh, Lord have mercy. I talked about that today. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I talked about that today in uh, at the Olive Branch meeting. Um, and, and I chose the Olive Branch Rotary Club to talk about that um, because I, I do worry about, and I don't mean that in a bad way, <laughs> <laughs> I do think that we are not only uh, we we in our media bubbles, but we are in our political bubbles. We are in our our um, uh, own silos and, and in our own intractable places. Uh, and I don't know how to get out of it other than through leadership. And that's leadership uh, at uh, in every way. That's that's good diverse, inclusive political leadership, but it's also leadership uh, with media companies uh, and media outlets, um, both in Memphis and everywhere else. Um, we have to have uh, a rational voices getting through to the masses. And again, I don't know how to do that because we have spent so many years going into our bubbles uh, and we've made everything political. I mean, I did tell the group today, it should not be political where the, where, uh, whether you wear a mask or not. That should not be a political issue. It is wrong that it is a political issue. Um, and, but we made it one. And we made it one because leadership, political leadership decided to make it one. So what we need is just good leadership at the highest levels of government, uh, of business, and of media uh, to help lead us out of this, I call it this dense forest of divisiveness that we're in. Any questions? Other questions? A good question. Just a comment, Otis. Um, I had the opportunity on Saturday to work with the Memphis Rotary. We did the food bank at St. Patrick's. And yes, I was there. Uh -huh. It was not only a good amount of service that was done, but certainly they, uh, as a club, you well represented everything you've just talked about. And I thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, we've done um, seven of those uh, so far. Um, and they have been uh, very successful. We fed uh, an average of about, or provided food for an average of 500 um, people uh, or cars um, uh, that came through uh, down at uh, St. Patrick's. Um, and it's one of the things that, and I give the credit on that one to Joe Birch. Uh, Joe Birch is, is a, 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 a he, he will be following me as president of, um, of, of Memphis Rotary. Uh, and I've gotten to see Joe Birch in a different light over the last couple of <laughs> years. So mm -hmm. Joe was a very hardworking and a very committed guy in this community. I mean, I've, I've known him for almost 40, over 40 years. Um, but to get to work with him on that project and on just overall leadership uh, within the Memphis Rotary, um, uh, we have a, a, a newfound mutual respect for each other, even though we work at different television stations and, and we've been competitors over the years. Uh, we, are, we are partners in this effort um, to, to make the Memphis Rotary do the things that I talked about, to inform and inspire and serve and lead. So I thank you for saying that, Mike. Okay, Otis, I have a question, Charlotte. Yes. Yes. First, I would like to say you were just a little bit too early for us because we had planned to induct you into the coolest Rotary Club in the city, the Midtown. <laughs> but you just moved a bit too, too fast for us, but we'll wait for next year after your term is up and we'll induct you then. 
Okay. <laughs> but my question is, I think that when we look at differences and diversity, it really is all about communication and how we communicate. And I really appreciate the way that you uh, communicate with grit, but also with gentleness. So thank you for that. Thank you so much. Um, thank you yeah. So much. And one question I had, you know, communication is such a big thing. Are there any initiatives that are on the forefront with, with, with high school students? Um, because I think it's, I mean, as early as we can start, I think we need to start. Like even debate clubs or things like that. Are there any initiatives through the university? Well, let me uh, let, let me respond to a couple of things you said previously, and then I'll get to that. First okay. of all, uh, uh, Father Don Mowry got me into the Memphis Rotary Club back around yeah. 2006. Uh, and I had so much respect for him that uh, it would be hard to drag me away from that. But I'll listen to an offer that you have later on. Okay, okay. I knew Father Mowry too. <laughs> okay. So I know his points. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, I really had a lot of respect for him. Uh, but, to, but to answer your question, is, is the answer, the short answer is we don't have anything at this time. But let me tell you what we did have, and I'm still upset that we lost it. Now, back in 1997, we started a high school newspaper, the Commercial Appeal. It was a partnership between the Commercial Appeal, the University of Memphis Journalism Department, and the Memphis City Schools. Uh, and we started something called the Teen Appeal. And it was for high school seniors and juniors. And it lasted 18 years. Yeah. Where we, produced, we produced a lot of students who went on to, to major in journalism uh, or do other things. As a matter of fact, uh, some of you on this call probably know who Katori Hall is. Mm -hmm. Katori Hall is an outstanding playwright. Um, Katori Hall was a Teen Appeal student uh, and she, she honed her writing skills by working on the Teen Appeal. Mm -hmm. We have students who came through the Teen Appeal who are still working in journalism right now. Uh, down in Florida and, and, and in Jackson, Tennessee. Um, but because Scripps was the major funder for that program, when Scripps sold the commercial appeal, they abandoned Memphis. And after a, and in abandoning Memphis, they said, we, we, we're not going to fund the, the teen appeal anymore. And so we went out to try to get some other funding, uh, but we we were not successful because um, people only saw it as a newspaper project. They didn't see it as an educational tool. They didn't see it that we were, we were transitioning to online for to help students understand how to do uh, journalism online. Nobody was interested in that. And so we lost the funding for it. And that's, and that's why we had to close it down about four years ago. Um, we've been talking about some other things. We had a summer journalism workshop a couple of years ago for high school students. Um, but un until we get some financial support um, to do it, um, we don't have anything that's, uh, that's readily available for high school students right now. It's something we still need to work on, but we don't have it right now. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? Other questions? Let me see here. Okay, how do we create media that is not considered fake news? How does the consumer check to see how reliable media info is? Um, wow, that's a good that's a good question, <laughs> Denise. I think that's coming from you. Um, First of all, um, we need to stop using the term fake news. Fake news was something, Donald Trump didn't create the term. Um, fake news was actually um, started before him when there was uh, some people, I think it was out in, uh, I did some research on this and even I think I even included it in a column uh, a few years back. 
Um, there were people out in, I, I want to say Denver or maybe it was California who made it their um, uh, um, pastime to just create stories and put them on a website. They were just creating stuff. Uh, and they found that people were going to their website and, 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 and reading those stories. They were total fiction uh, and, and, and they didn't have any pretense about them being real. And that's where the term fake news first came from. But of course, fake news has been around forever. All you got to do is go to the supermarket uh, checkout counter and you see all kinds of fake news there. <laughs> with the National Enquirer and the Globe and the book or whatever. <laughs> you know, I, I show my students every semester copies of front pages, including one that says uh, Hillary Clinton had alien baby. You know, so all of that stuff has been out there. But, but what Donald Trump was able to do, and he did it pretty effectively, unfortunately, he was able to convince his supporters that anything that was critical of him or that, sh that shined a light at what he was really doing in a lot of cases, he was able to tell his supporters that all of that was fake news. And so he used fake news every day. And then people adopted that. And they started to calling what uh, legitimate journalism was what the New York Times and the Washington Post, even the Wall Street Journal and what CNN was doing and even local news uh, organizations, people started calling it fake news. Well, I don't know how to combat that other than to con just continue to do what we do, which is to report the news as fairly uh, and as accurately when we're making commentary, like the, which is what I do, I do opinion journalism. It's all based on solid reporting, uh, based on experiences that I've had. The only thing I know to do on that, Denise, is to continue to report the, the news and tell people what really is happening. Uh, and the truth, you know, that's what's one of our four tests is Rotary. <laughs> is it the truth? And that's what we ask all the time in newsrooms. Uh, is it the truth? Uh, because one of, our, uh, one of our four jobs as journalists, the number, one, one, the number one job is to seek the truth and report it. And that's what we try to do. And we can't control what people, whether people call us fake news or not. We just continue to try to do our jobs. All right. I believe Miria had a question notice. Uh, it's uh, your chat feed. You might want to address it about other cultures. Yeah. yeah. Uh, is this the one, uh, Ms. Chaffee? Okay. He says, uh, I'm fascinated by my journey. I don't live in Memphis yet, but I really can't wait to get there soon. What can you say about journalism in other languages and for other cultures? Is there such a thing at the university? Um, that's a really good question. Um, well, we don't, obviously the department does not focus on journalism in other cultures or other languages, but, but we do, I, I talk about it sometimes in one, on some of my theory classes, uh, because I teach, uh, I teach a class called Media, Diversity and Society. And this is a class for seniors and grad students that I, I, I give sort of a, a, a 35,000 foot look at media in all of its forms. And one of the things that I talk about in that class is how uh, media companies in other countries, how they do their jobs. Mm -hmm. For example, down in, um, in, in South America and Central America, Traditional print journalism is still very, very strong. People uh, buy and subscribe and get um, newspapers there. Same thing really in Great Britain. I mean, you've probably seen that over the last couple of days with the uh, Meghan, Meghan Markle story because the tabloids uh, in, in Great Britain are still very, very powerful. 
Um, but I also uh, uh, give a lecture in that class, even about journalism in North Korea and how despite the, 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 the heavy handedness of the um, Kim Jong-un regime there, journalism still finds a way even in North Korea. There have been instances over the last several years of, 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 of citizens in North Korea who are <laughs> getting information out to, to South Korea and China about what's going on in North Korea, sometimes at their own risk uh, of death, but they are doing it because they want the information to get out. Uh, and I call that lecture, uh, journalism always finds a way. And it does, mm -hmm. um, despite attempts to censor uh, and to repress in foreign countries, journalism finds a way, um, but we don't teach a lot uh, about journalism in other countries in our department. Maybe it's something that we probably should should do. Yeah, thank you for answering that. I guess my where I was coming from with that actually is your you and your other the other journalists are a great asset to the community. And I'm just wondering if other cultures and languages have such an advocate as yourself in that same platform, because traditionally in communities. There is journalism in their own language, but it's isolated within the community. Mm -hmm. and rarely does it cross over to the main um, form of conversations that are happening over here. And, and perhaps there is a, an integration that is already happening naturally by bilingual, like bicultural journalists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't understand the demographics, obviously, of the community, so I wouldn't even know what cultures exist. Mm -hmm. here and are they represented within the mainstream journalism platform? Well, uh, we have a uh, we have obviously we have a a, a large population um, uh, Latino population here in Memphis, uh, and the journalism there actually is is doing quite well. Um, there were when I was back at the Commercial Appeal, we used to have a partnership um, with a Spanish language newspaper in Memphis, uh, La Prensa. Um, Latina, Prensa Latina. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, that I think that partnership has long gone away. Um, but um, if you're willing to partner up again, we'll 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 come over. I promise. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's Ben. Well, I'm, not that's at, ben. I'm not at the CA anymore, so that might be something for the people at the Daily Memphian to consider. I'll uh, talk to Eric. I'll talk to Eric about yeah, it. Talk to Eric about that. <laughs> But but we also uh, we uh, you know all, obviously before COVID hit, um, we would put on seminars um, and workshop at at the university all the time. We would talk about journalism issues, and we would try to make uh, and we would make those panel discussions and and the issues that we discussed there would be very diverse, culturally diverse, uh, and and invite people from all areas of the community into that. So that that's one thing that we do at the university. Thank you. All right. And can interested people still audit courses at the U of M? Absolutely. I've had, uh, again, before COVID hit, I used to have uh, people come to my uh, class all the time to audit it, especially the, uh, the media diversity and society class. That's, that's one. Yeah, that's, I'm interested in that. I'm sorry, what'd you say, Pan? I'm interested in that. Oh, you would be more than welcome to come to that class. I mean, because we do some, I mean, we get after it in that class. <laughs> I love it. That's great. <laughs> As a matter of fact, uh, uh, we were on a, um, on a two day, we call we do, we're not having a spring break this year. We're having a, a two day wellness break. We had it yesterday and today. We'll have another one in April. But when we start back on Wednesday and Thursday of this week, I, I teach that class on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And uh, Thursday, my topic is on uh, tabloid journalism and, imp and how it impacted the, uh, the Meghan Markle story. So oh, we talk about contemporary things in that class. We talk about, uh, we talk about a lot of hard hitting issues in that class. Uh, that would be one that you may want to uh, consider auditing somewhere down the line. Mm -hmm. I'd welcome you anytime. 
Thank, thank you. Good. When we went to India, when Carl led a rotary group, yes, India, we learned about the enormous explosion of newspapers. Oh, yes. In India at that time. And this is right when ours were starting on the major decline that they've mm -hmm. since been on, but not so in India. I mean, it's oh, no, not in India. Uh, again, uh, portions of Great Britain, certainly not in South and Central America. Uh, newspapers are thriving. Ben, you can uh, 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 attest to this. It, it is thriving. Yeah, especially yellow journalism like you're uh, referring to. And like you said, Rupert Murdoch's son, that's one of the best newspapers in the world. In the US. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 Very interesting. Yeah. 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 All right. Any other questions that anyone has? Um, Otis, yes. in terms of auditing, do you have to formally uh, be part of the course or is it a matter of doing like a Zoom and having the link and just being quiet? <laughs> well, <laughs> you don't have to be quiet. <laughs> um, well, uh, uh, well, actually in, in the fall, we hope and we anticipate that we will get back to live classes. So um, I think it's just a matter of, of enrolling, uh, doing that through uh, the registrar's office. Um, but people who audit the class are not obligated to do any of the homework. So I won't have you doing all the stuff that I have my regular students doing, uh, but you can come in and, uh, and participate in the discussions. Uh, uh, and just, you know, get in it, get involved with, the, with, you know, mixing it up with the students in the class. Um, uh, again, it's been highly effective in, in several of the classes that I teach. So that all you have to do is register with the registrar. Thanks. All right. Yes. Okay, Otis. Mm -hmm. Now you see how cool we are. How many, how many speaking engagements do you have that people say, how can I audit your class? How many? <laughs> I haven't had that yet. <laughs> see how cool we are? So we okay. want to really thank you. Yeah, Mid thank you. And actually I, yeah, <laughs> actually, I guess you could attend two meetings because we meet at the cool 530 social hour and you meet at noon. So you could attend both. But we really appreciate everything you've done, not only for Rotarians, but for the community. Yay. Bravo. You are a, yeah. yeah, you are a shining light in a, in a sometimes dark place. <laughs> thank so, you so much. Uh, thank I, you I for joining us. I really okay, remember, I remember your invitation. There's a standing invitation. All right. And I will remember that. Matter of fact, you got my email address. Send me, as long as you're on Zoom, send, send me a Zoom invite. Okay, uh, you know I'll do it. <laughs> pop in from time to time. I'd be happy. Okay. To, I'd be sure, happy. thank you. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? <laughs> Any other comments? Anybody? Well, oh, that's it. I have one. I have one other. I wanted okay. to thank you in, in past years when we have done an essay contest at Snowden for yes. these young people, we, it's still going. Good. And Good. so uh, I had actually put in my grant that we would have you help present the awards and talk to students a little bit about journalism. If, if, if with your time, might you do that? Well, <laughs> it depends on what time it is and when it is, and I'll certainly try to work it into my schedule. Absolutely. That's great. I'm happy to do that. You know, one of, one of the things, and again, I, I, I go back again to that anecdote um, about Mr. Darby. Um, I, I believe it's incumbent upon me to do everything I can to encourage young people. Yeah, because I got encouraged. Yeah, I even got encouraged by Mr. Darby. I certainly got encouraged by other, you know, the, uh, I had a high school journalism teacher. Um, you know, I, I, I went to an inferior school. Yeah, we, it wasn't the greatest school in the world, but we did have a journalism class there. It was taught by somebody who was an English teacher, but, you know, he did he did a good job. Uh, and he encouraged me to get into journalism and stay in journalism. So I, I, I look back at that and I look about how my parents uh, supported me every step of the way and I, how I had great mentors. 
when I got into the field, you know, Angus McCarron was my mentor mm -hmm. uh, for many years, the editor and publisher of the Commercial Appeal. Um, so I feel it's my duty, Pan, to try to help young people as much as I can because people help me. So if we can work out the uh, uh, time uh, and, and, and the day to do this, I'd be more than happy to do it. Thank you. Okay, good deal. Good. All right. All right, anybody else? Thank you again, Otis. Well, thank you. I appreciate no, it. Good you. to see you. Sure. I'll, I'll pop back in again one of these days and, uh, and listen in on what's going on. We'll make sure that. Can right. we give Otis a hand? Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good night, everybody. Good night. All right. Uh, we want to take a few minutes to uh, acknowledge our good friend, Dustin, and the legacy that he left. Uh, Mike, were you going to say something about that? Yes, I'd love to. Um, I mean, Daniel, I'm sorry. Referring, you're Daniel. referring to Drew Daniel, who we lost this year. Drew um, and I kind of crossed paths in a number of ways, and certainly our interest in polio. My dad was a polio specialist and attended the Copenhagen conference, and I became a Rotarian, not, a, not only of service and leadership, but also because of polio and what we do with the Gates Foundation. Um, there have been a lot of um, social media, and if anybody got the commercial appeal on Sunday, there was uh, on page three quite a long introduction and coverage of Drew and um, what he had done. But what was left out of everything that I read was the fact that he was a Rotarian, which disappointed me terribly, because that's how I knew Drew. I told the reporter that he was involved. I don't know why she left that out. I'm sorry. No, not at all. Um, but Drew and I um, kind of shared the setups as we began our meetings at the College of Optometry. And that's really where I met him and got to know him. And um, Drew and I, I think if I were to describe him, it was with the old adage, um, never late, but you know, better never late. And Drew was certainly uh, put service above self and just about everything he did, whether it was Boy Scouts or work in the community or work for the city. Um, when, uh, I mentioned we had one of these times where we both showed up early, got it done, we're set up and he's drew, enjoyed his beer and I'd have a glass of red wine. And we sat down and conversation started with just listening to each other. It turns out we're fraternity brothers at two different schools with the same initials, used to be anyway. And Drew already knew that Michigan State had lost our chapter during the Vietnam era and he made sure that I was able to attend and was included in the U of M alumni affairs and the uh, chapter happenings. And I was very grateful for that. Um, I was surprised, I guess, at Drew's passing. I would never have imagined I have a son that was close in age to Drew and certainly wouldn't have expected it. And it was ironic when I heard about it, I was going through my father's um, albums. And uh, if anybody has a glass, I'd raise one and a toast. If you don't, just smile and acknowledge it. But what I found was a small poem that I thought describes Drew in every sense of the word. Not how he died, but how he lived. Not what he gained, but what he gave. Those are the units, the measure of worth, as a man is a man, regardless of birth. Not what was his station, but what was his heart? And how did he play his God-given part? Was he ever really a work of cheer to bring back a smile and to banish a tear? Not what was his church, nor what was his creed, but had he befriended those really in need? Not what did the sketch in the newspaper say? But how many were sorry when he passed away? Drew, here's to you. Oh, that's it. <laughs>
Ben? I don't think I can follow that. Um, what's already been said by friends, family, luminaries of the community, um, I don't have to tell y'all, he was an amazing person. Um, whenever I think of him, I think he exemplified the virtues of kindness, selfishness, and perseverance. Um, and I just, I, I know that he would want me to be here today and he'll be, be incredibly honored by the words that are spoken here. Um, I'm actually sitting on the porch where we last had a beer. Um, so that was a nice toast. Um, but I, I just know that I, for one, I'm gonna, I'm gonna continue his legacy of service and make this world a better place in his memory. And I know you, I know you and this distinguished uh, organization will do the same. And, I, and I'd like to sort of echo that the last conversation I had with Drew was really about trying to expand our Rotary Club as far as diversity. And then, you, you know, listen about that, you're right. Right. You know, and it and I mean, it was probably well just before our last meeting. And then so when you showed up, I thought, OK, so Drew is not just talking it. He is really on it. And you then when I listen, yeah. right. And when I listen to when I listen to Otis tonight talking about diversity and inclusion and communication, I thought this is a perfect this is a perfect meeting for Drew. The message that we heard tonight was Drew because Drew had a service soul. And it didn't matter who, didn't matter your, your political, your political, your color, your uh, anything. He was just about service. So Ben, I think he's passed that baton on you. And please, even though he's, even though he's with us spiritually, we want you to be with us physically. I will not let him down, trust me. Thank you. I promise Charlotte, that to everybody here. Charlotte, if I could just add a, a quick note. Uh, sure. th the last few months, Drew was checking in with me by text every week. Uh, mm -hmm. He attended uh, my series, my mindfulness series for the University of Memphis Alumni Association last uh, summer and fall. And and he he sent he texted me because he wasn't able to do one of my rotary mindfulness sessions, but he would check in with me every week. And when I saw on my my village email network, I, I saw the reference to Drew Daniel, and I called Denise and asked her if it was our Drew, and she says it was. He last texted me on February 25th, just you know checking in, saying how I'm doing, everything okay. And, you know, Drew was such a light. He always had a smile. He was just such a gentle soul. Um, and so it's a real loss to me. Um, you know, my heart just still breaks at such a young age for him to, uh, to leave this world. So I uh, just wanted to, to add that. Thank you. Um, and one of the things that um, we had thought about, I think, uh, Dustin, you have it in the chat about if you want to donate to one of Drew's heartfelt missions was the Polio Foundation. So if you want to donate to that in Drew's name. Also, uh, we had another member, Dale, thought that it would be a good idea to send notes and, and maybe cards and we'll get that information, contact information with his family at the same time. But it was a, it's a big miss. What about a 5K? Um, he loved running. Um, that would be a good way. So, uh, a 5K uh, where the don where the proceeds go to polio or something like that. Right. That that is something we could consider because there is another world where maybe we could even team up with them that does a 5K. So we could just make it. Um, I mean, something we could we could definitely consider, and particularly since you'll be with us, you won't let us forget it. Maybe we could make it a, a double effort. You're right. Thank you. Uh, anything else anyone want to say about Drew? Uh, Oh, wait a minute. One, one other thing. Dustin, did you have, did you want to bring us up on the new volunteer effort? Thank you for coming, Dan. It's an honor and a pleasure. Yeah. Uh, Dustin, wanna, have an update. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I just want to thank everyone for your kind words about Drew. Um, that was really awesome to hear. 
And um, yeah, just to briefly give you an update, uh, this Thursday, our club is hosting um, a lunch for Community Alliance for the Homeless. And Community Alliance for the Homeless is the lead agency for Memphis and Shelby County, designated by the Housing and Urban Development Department to um, help connect local homeless service providers to uh, federal efforts and um, basically put an end to uh, homelessness or try to reduce it um, here in our community. And um, so that'll be happening um, this Thursday and uh, the rest of the proceeds that won't be um, going towards the lunch will go towards the projects um, that they're currently working on. Uh, the move-in basket for uh, people newly housed will receive um, different uh, toiletries and cleaning items. And then also emergency shelters, um, they're giving them uh, care bags and it'll basically be uh, different other uh, toiletries items that people could use as well in those situations. And, and for those of us that want to come and volunteer to help or just to see the facility on Thursday, can you give us uh, the address and the times for that? Yeah, I could definitely do that. You can put it in the chat. Okay. Could, well, if we put it in the chat, that'll reach the people that are here. Could we send an email to the club? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I could definitely do that. Did you, did you send one to Denise already? Not yet, right? No, I have not. Okay. Okay. That's fine. Yeah, we didn't want to throw too much stuff in one email. So you'll get that tomorrow, would you say, Dustin? Um, yeah, I can yeah, and Denise, ready. okay, and then I'll, okay. I can speak to Denise about um, when we could have that ready too. Okay, Sorry thank you, you, Dustin. If you could just make sure that because a lot of people won't be able to do something on Thursday, but they'll still want to be supported. So if you could give multiple ways to support it, it would be great, like yeah. donating groceries versus sure. showing up at a lunch. Okay, yeah. very good. Thanks. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Okay. And just let me know too, Denise, if you need my help, uh, I could also try to help email it out and everything too. Okay, that Thank wouldn't you. be a problem. Uh, it's, been, it's been a, this has been a memorable evening. It's good. Thank you everyone. Mm -hmm. Oh, and uh, on the 23rd, our speaker will be Eric Barnes, so we'll be still in the journalism mode and we'll hear lots of other things. Invite, invite your friends and um, just as we leave, let's leave. With the memory of our friend, leaving service. Thank you. Thank you, Shar. Thanks, Shar. Thank you. Good night all. Night. Good night. Good night.